Hello! This episode is brought to you as part of Wanted Design Manhattan Online, a conversation series presented with Design Milk and Clever. Each day from May 11th to the 22nd, 2020, we'll feature design dialogues, including new episodes of Clever and engaging live conversations with very special guests. To view the schedule and register for events, head to wanteddesignnyc.com slash online. That's wanteddesignnyc.com slash online. Support for Clever comes from the Polish Cultural Institute, New York. EcoSolidarity is a multidisciplinary project that is the result of a collaboration with Tomek Rigalik and Studio Rigalik with the help of Wanted Design that brings together art and design into one platform for sharing ideas in the public space by integrating local communities as well as international design industries. Please stay tuned after my talk with Aisha Bursell to hear a special presentation with Tomek Rigalik about this exceptional project called Circula and visit circula.org to learn more. That's C-I-R-C-U-L-A dot org. Now on with the show. So design is all about how can we solve problems collaboratively and with empathy and optimism and with an open mind so that we can better our lives. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Devers, and this is Clever. Today I'm excited to bring you a conversation with Aisha Bersell. Aisha is an award-winning industrial designer and co-founder of Bersell Plus Sec, a human-centered design and innovation studio she operates with BB Sec, her partner in life and design. Renowned for her work with Herman Miller, Toto, Target, Ikea, and many others, she is one of Fast Company's Most Creative People 2017. In addition to product design, she authored the book, Design the Life You Love, based on the idea that life is just like a design problem and anyone can design the life they've always wanted using the principles of design and her four-step creative process. Here's Aisha. I'm Aisha Bircel, and I live and work in New York, Midtown, and I am a designer of products, services, and experiences. I also teach people how to design the life and work they love using my design process, deconstruction, reconstruction. I am so excited to learn all about that. But before we get there, I always love to take a tour through your formative years to figure out kind of how you got to be you. Will you take us back to your childhood and tell me what that was like? I'm so glad you asked about my childhood. <laughs> These days, I um, actually say hello to my seven-year-old self every day oh. uh, because I feel like that's my real person. So I grew up in Turkey mm -hmm. in a family of lawyers. I thought I was going to become a lawyer until I realized I really love to draw and thought maybe I should become an artist. Then I thought... How about architecture until I discovered design, industrial design? So what was your, your hometown like and what was it like living in a family of lawyers? Was everybody litigating and presenting airtight cases? Or tell me about your family dynamic. I grew up in Izmir, which at the time was a small um, Aegean city, kind of quiet and beautiful and I remember getting really bored on Sundays. <laughs> so my dad and my uncles, my aunts, they all, almost everyone, my great uncle, all of them were lawyers. But they were also very interested in the arts and architecture and history. Mm. So there was this kind of nice balance. And growing up in Izmir, we... Izmir is really close to Ephesus, where there are all these beautiful Roman ruins. So my parents would take my brother and I to Ephesus on weekends for like um, day trips. And my father loved history, so he would talk about Ephesus and everything that happened. And I remember um, just being bored of out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> So I must have like looked really bored and my dad was like, you know, what's going on? And he was like, 
I want to go home. And he said, well, why don't you imagine how people lived here thousands of years ago and the streets of Ephesus are lined with marble and you can see, still see the marks of the chariots' uh, wheels. And he was like, you see those grooves? Those were made by chariots. And, you know, chariots were these, you know, vehicles with horses and Roman soldiers and this and that. And he started, started describing it to me. And um, I think that's the first time I realized the power of imagination. And that really changed my perspective. And I, I started imagining things that were not in front of my eyes, but um, inside my head. Mm. And how old were you when you had that? I was like five. Wow. And what a formative experience that was. And visualization clearly is a big part of your work now, but... My superpower, yes. My, my superpowers are being visual and solving problems visually. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. I want to hear about this, this seven-year-old, Aisha, that you greet every morning and why that's important that you say hello to your inner child. I'll tell you a little anecdote. I used to walk from home to school by myself, and I was a little kid, right? Um, mm-hmm. But between home and school, there was another school, the um, French school, that my mother would send me every now and then. And so one spring day, it must have been around this time of the year. It was beautiful. And instead of going directly to school, I stopped by the French school and went into their garden. And I don't think anybody knows about this except now you and your (laughs) listeners. My mom doesn't know. I went to the garden in the back and the garden was all fully grown with wildflowers. It was incredibly beautiful. And these flowers came up almost to my height. And And among those flowers, there were these beautiful little red ladybugs just kind of flying around. And I remember to this day running around inside those um, flowers and running after the little red bugs, you know, ladybugs. And then I did that and then felt great, Mm -hmm. came back out, went to school. And it's just (laughs) that spirit of that little girl that did something without telling anyone and felt feeling completely in control, very independent, very like, this is my life and I'm enjoying it and I'm running around in flowers and among ladybugs. To me, that's my essence. Mm -hmm. Being a grown up every now and then, I need to reach back into that essence and and say, are you still there? So... (laughs) (laughs) I love that so much. And I felt for a second like I was running around with the ladybugs with you. And Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's beautiful. So tell me how the, the seven-year-old progressed into teenage years and when you took your love of drawing and playfulness and visualization and understood that it might become industrial design. I mean, were you still thinking you'd be a lawyer or were you rebelling against that in your teenage years? What were those like? In a funny way, my parents were incredibly supportive of my decision. So they didn't insist, like my dad didn't insist, oh, you need to become a lawyer. And now being a parent, I really appreciate you know, what it takes for a parent to just stand back and let your kid decide what they want to do. Yeah, and so, that's, <laughs> that's got to be rough. <laughs> And especially like industrial design, right? At the time, industrial design, especially in Turkey, was a very young profession. Um, and the way I find out about it's it still is still very because, misunderstood, I think. Oh, and very misunderstood to this day. I was thinking of doing architecture, and a friend of my family came to tea and talked to me about industrial design. And the way this took place is we were having tea, and he asked me, Do you know what industrial design is? And And I was like, no. And he said, look, this teacup that we're using, how the edge is curved, it's so that it fits in our lips better and it has a handle so we we can hold hot liquid in our hands without burning ourselves. And the saucer is there. It's designed so that if you spill your tea, you won't ruin your mother's beautiful tablecloth. And just that description of industrial design, that something thought about the relationship of an object to a person. 
mm-hmm. mesmerized me. And I thought, that's what I want to do. And I fell in love with the human scale of industrial design. And to this day, I'm in love with it. And, and that, that was the beginning. I don't remember a specific anecdote like that, but I know when I started to realize how the built world comes together around me and that humans were responsible for making every decision, you know, in terms of how cities are laid out, how buildings get built, why things are the way they are, and every product that I interfaced with, I started to get so fascinated in all of those decisions and also so confounded that it's still so misunderstood by by so many people, even though there are so many people hard at work on the built world. And when you had this magical moment with that teacup, the fact that you had a direct connection to a field of study, I think is really important. I wish that more young people understood that industrial design is something you can go off to school and study. We've talked to so many people who don't discover it until they get to college and they're fishing around for a major. How old were you when you had this teacup revelation? I was 15. 15, perfect. <laughs> so, so that gave you some, some structure to your teenage years because you had a, you had a destination to work toward. It really did. And I was so determined to study industrial design that in Turkey, you had this university exam, somewhat similar to SATs, but a little bit different in that you would enter the exam and make a list of the schools you want to go into. And depending on what you got from the, you know, your score from the exam, you could get to your top choice or you could get into your 20th choice. I think it had like 20, 25 options. Mm. And I remember I put down just one school and it was Middle East Technical University Industrial Design Department. And I left all of it open. And so it was kind of like hit or miss. (laughs) (laughs) I will do this and I will do only this. Luckily, I got in. Thank God. What were the college years like? The college years were amazing. I mean, I feel like that's when I really came into my own. I just love the studio environment and being uh, on my own in Ankara, where my parents were in Izmir, and I lived in Ankara for the first time, uh, kind of as like this mini adult Aisha and... (laughs) And all people were asking me to do was think creatively, and I loved every minute of it. I felt like I found a missing piece of myself. Yeah, it it was just great. And I met some amazing people. You know, some of my best friends are still from those years. From what I understand, you also landed a Fulbright at Pratt, and that brought you to New York City. Amy, you did your research. Now when I look back on it, I'm like, how did that happen? How how did that happen? Obviously, you applied for it and and you were granted it. But did you have your sights set on New York City? It was actually a piece of rebellion on my part because my parents always told me, like, you could go and do your master's in the States. And this is kind of what, I guess, in Turkey – a lot of families try to send their kids to Europe or um, the States kind of for higher education and, you know, learning a second or third language. And so as an ideal, I really had that in my head that if I'm, you know, if I graduate and if I'm a good student, I, I'll get to go to the States. But as my graduation day kind of approached, I could see that my parents were hesitating and, mm-hmm. you know, the idea of, I, I was really a young graduate. I was 20 years old when I graduated from Middle East Technical. And, and I, I could see that they were hesitating about sending their daughter all the way to the States. And I thought to myself, I need to find an alternative way. And I applied for Fulbright. I got it. And, I, and then I was like, okay. I don't know if you're sending me, but I'm going. You designed yourself a a parent acceptable path to going to New York City. I did. And, (laughs) you know, again, my parents were incredibly um, supportive, but that's part of the independence that was also drilled into me. I was like, okay, let me let me do this. And the other thing about Pratt that was so interesting, like the choice of New York 
like to this day, I can't tell you why New York, but there was something inside me that just kept on saying, you need to go to New York. And so it's, it's a dream come true for me. But also I had a, an art teacher in high school who was a graduate of Pratt and who, industrial design, by the way, um, mm. who would try and explain to me the, the principles of basic design and three-dimensional design as it's taught at Pratt and the whole curriculum of, for those people, designers who know um, Rowena Reed, uh, Rowena Reed Costello's her three-dimensional design education, which is an incredible education and quite unique. But anyways, I, I remember being like 13, 14, 15, and my art teacher trying to explain these things to me, and I didn't understand one bit of what he was saying and uh, until I came to Pratt. So you kind of got a double Pratt education. You got primed for it at 13, 14, 15, and then you got the real deal. Exactly. And Amy, I have to tell you, I didn't realize the connection many years later as I was like talking about it. And suddenly it clicked in my head that I was like, hold on one second. That's the wire exercise he was trying to teach me. He, the negative space that he was trying to get me to understand. And as a young kid, I was like, I don't know what he's talking about. There's positive and negative space. What? <laughs> Those were like all Rowena's teachings. And then Rowena became my teacher at Pratt and actually my first friend uh, in New York. And so that, that's kind of like a full circle. Oh, my gosh. That's totally full circle. It's foreshadowing. It's so magical how life does that sometimes. Yeah. 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 So after graduation, I mean, did you know you were going to stay in New York City? Did you feel homesick? What were your first few steps into the professional world like? And were you feeling wobbly or sure-footed? Here, here's my take on New York. When you come to New York as a foreigner, um, the first year you're so excited and you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. And so the first year goes by really fast and, and quite happy. The second year is kind of, it sinks into you that you're far away from home and it's really hard to make friends and people are too busy in New York running around and chasing their dreams. And so the second year is usually um, quite depressive. So I was... Um, depressed and you know sleeping till noon and kind of dreaming of my family and my friends back in turkey and without realizing that that's what being depressed feels like mm -hmm. um and then the third year is if you're still here that's when you love new york and you become a new yorker and i stayed for the third year and um, that's when i graduated and i'm still here 30 years later. <laughs> yes. And the, my, the thing that made a huge difference for me was as I was graduating, um, the chair of industrial design at the time was Bruce Hanna. And he's my professor and he was an amazing um, teacher. And he asked me if I wanted to work on a project with him. And so that was my entry to industrial design professionally was incredibly smooth. Thank, thanks to Bruce. Yes. <laughs> and what a major validation as well. You wouldn't believe it. it. It was quite incredible. And it was actually a project that Bruce was doing for Noel. He was designing office accessories. And I got to meet uh, Andrew Kogan, who is... 27 at the time, and he's uh, now the CEO and CEO of Noel, and um, and we became friends. So I was like 24, he was 27, and then Bruce was this amazing mentor. Um, so that actually went beautifully. And when Noel introduced the orchestra office accessory collection, Bruce gave me credit, and it came out as. Bruce Hanna, Aisha Bursell collection. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. And this yeah. is so easy. <laughs> Little did I know that, that that was just a... Well, yeah, you have to tell me, with a, with a <laughs> shoehorn like that into the professional world, did you have some hard knocks after that without being uh, 
guided into the professional space so carefully? Yes, I did. <laughs> okay, let's hear about that because I feel yeah. like those epic challenges, they temper us, right? They, that's what helps us learn and become resilient. I hope the moment that we're in is also teaching us some great lessons. <laughs> That was actually a great entryway in the profession. And I was young enough and stupid enough to think, oh, this is great. I'll just like start my own studio and then I'll have clients like Noel and Andrew and uh, collaborators like Bruce. And, and then for the next two and a half, three years, I had no clients. I could barely make ends meet. And um, I freelanced here and there and was really quite desperate and thought, okay, so maybe I should become a lawyer. You know, this design thing is really hard. So that, that was my glamorous entry and then learning my place. How seriously did you actually entertain the idea of becoming a lawyer? I know that it was in your DNA from your family, so it may have felt like a, a choice that was safe, but it's hard to be a lawyer too. It's hard to be a lawyer too. And um, luckily, another friend came to my help. I feel like you're always saved by your friends. So, you know, Bruce gave me my first opportunity. And then when I was really feeling desperate, it turns out Tucker V. Meister was one of the co-founders of Smart Design, and um, he became a friend. Mm -hmm. And so he was participating in this um, seminar worldwide seminar that Toto Japan, Toto, the bathroom company, mm -hmm. uh, was putting together in Japan about the um, culture of bathrooms, basically. And so unbeknownst to me, Tucker enters my thesis project, which was called The Water Room. And it was a um, con concept project around bathrooms. He sends them my project and says, you should invite this um, woman to the seminar. So I got invited oh. and Tucker was there and I was there and some you know, world famous designers were there and to talk about um, bathrooms. And I was kind of like the Turkish designer um, who had done this conceptual bathroom and Turkey and Turkish culture is very well known for their bath culture. So it was, that was kind of why I ended up there, but that um, changed my life. you know. I didn't, as you can see, I didn't become a lawyer. After that, I ended up living in Japan and working for Toto for a year. Yeah, toilets became a big part of your uh, repertoire. <laughs> yes, they did. I became known uh, as the queen of toilets. <laughs> yes. An award-winning uh, queen of toilets, as I understand. <laughs> yes. And the designer of uh, what's unofficially known as the world's most comfortable toilet seat. Oh, that's that's quite a contribution to society. I'm, it really and I'm not, is. I don't not, mean not that. many people can say they've designed toilets, and and I, I like that distinction. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you were working with Toto, were you already an independent designer? Had you started your studio? I had started my studio actually right after the uh, Knoll Orchestra collection came out thinking this is how things are done, but also because I had always seen my dad, who was an independent lawyer, he had his own small law firm in Turkey. Um, he was my model and example. I thought, okay, that's how things are done. So even when I knew nothing, I had my studio. But then Going to Toto and living in Japan for a year really uh, formed me. It's my army service. I felt like I, <laughs> I was a soldier, a designer soldier in Japan, where I really had to fight for my ideas because I was a foreigner, I was young, I was a woman. Oh, all of it, yeah. All of it in an environment like all those years ago where – People didn't really want to listen to me, and I really had to fight to make innovation happen. Can you describe that fight? Like, what was your strategy, your tactics? So the way it happened is, in the beginning, I just developed some concepts, and they were not supposed to go much of anywhere we, we were ideating. But then 
I hit upon an idea of Toto was interested in developing products for the American market. This was before Toto became such a well-known uh, brand in the States, and they were looking for an entryway into the American market. And they thought, hold on one second, instead of having this woman think about concepts, why don't we have her design, since she's coming from the States, why don't we have her design a product for the American market? And they said, we want you to design a washlet, basically a toilet seat with a bidet function inside it for the American market. So we start with that, and then I develop it. I work in Tokyo at their design office. And at the end of the first three months, we have this beautiful prototype that we share with their CEO and top three executives. And they approve it. And then they say, okay, now, Aisha, since you're the designer, you're going to take this to our factory in Kokura, in the Kyushu Island, in the southern um, island, um, and you're going to work with our engineers and make this toilet, you know, into a product. So I go to, you know, Kokura. Like I'm already in Tokyo, then I'm going to Kokura, a very different environment. It's kind of like Izmir, actually, a little port city. And so I explained to the engineers, we had this first meeting and I said, here are the things we need to change based on this design, this and this and this and this and this. And they looked at me and they said, no to this, no to this, no to this, no to this. And they went through my list and said no to everything that made that design what what it was, the, the innovation that it was. And things were they like, saying no because it, it would require tooling and things that they just weren't familiar with? They didn't even explain it. But okay. it was things like, one of, just to give you an example, one of my ideas was to make the seat and the lid basically detachable, snap on, snap off, so that you could actually snap the lid, snap the seat, wash it under the faucet, and uh -huh. then put it back on again, because uh -huh. I knew how to clean toilets, and that wasn't an easy thing to do. So this was an innovation. Yeah. And they were like, no, we're not going to do that. This is how we've always done things, and this is how we're always going to do things. And I thought to myself, okay, well, that doesn't make sense. Uh. And <laughs> so I sat down and I thought to myself, Aisha, you're here, you know, you left your life in New York, you're all by yourself in Kukura, and the executives approved your design, and all these engineers are basically saying no to you. You can't go back home without having done what you came here to do. Mm. You know, after all that you've sacrificed. Get, so get yeah. your act together, I told myself. And, you know, I was young. Sometimes you're really courageous when you're young. So I wrote a letter to the chief executive, like chief design person who had approved of the design. Uh -huh. uh, and he was an older Japanese gentleman. I wrote him a handwritten letter at the time. And I said, look, your team is not accepting the things that you approved me to do. I need your help. Three days later, we have a meeting, and they said yes to everything I asked for. Oh, you pulled rank. I did. <laughs> yes. But you were in a spot because they were too comfortable discounting you and what you were there to do. They were. You, yeah. They hated my guts. Oh, which is <laughs> Because you forced them to innovate. People, do, people resist change. and They really do. But that went on to become a very successful product for the company, right? So it did. And, you know, we won all kinds of awards and it was, you know, on the covers of design magazines and uh, in the New York Times magazine, it was all kinds of good stuff. It also led to my entry to uh, working with Herman Miller, you know, a story that uh, is 20 years long. So it was, um, for me, it, it was, I'm glad I stood my ground. Yes, and that long relationship with Herman Miller has been a fruitful relationship for, for both. Through my friends, while I was freelancing, I met a young uh, design manager, Leia Kaplan, who was younger than myself, but n totally knew how to manage projects and organize ideas. And to this day, she's one of my oldest and closest collaborators. She still tells me what to do and I listen to her. But anyways, <laughs> Leah Kaplan and I became friends. And one day she said, you know, Aisha, 
I want you to meet my dad. And I'm like, who's your dad? And she said, Ralph Kaplan. And I adored Ralph Kaplan. R- Ralph Kaplan was the editor in chief of ID magazine at the time. And he had written this beautiful seminal book on design called By Design, which I would recommend uh, all of your listeners, if they haven't read it, to read it. it it's an amazing and actually a funny, um, because Ralph is very humorous, um, funny book uh, on design. So then I meet Ralph and Ralph says, hmm, interesting. I think you need to meet my friends at Herman Miller. And that's how I got introduced to Herman Miller. But then when I met the people at Herman Miller, their, their executives. Mm-hmm. I was this young woman with this toilet exper- experience in my pocket. But at the time, the product hadn't come out yet. I couldn't show them the product. I could tell them about the product. So kind of like the way I've done with you, I told them some of the product stories. And a couple of days later, they told me, we're interested. We like how you think we're interested in working with you. And years later, they told me um, it was actually Don Goman, Herman Miller's design director for many, many years. And I've collaborated with him almost on uh, all my projects uh, at Herman Miller. And it was, he said, Aisha, you know, the reason we hired you is because we figured if you can work with Japanese engineers on innovative products, you could work with our engineers in Michigan. That's why we hired you. So, so Wow. <laughs> Wow. So standing your ground and fighting that fight really was a very important chapter in your life. It really was. Not to overinflate it, but I think it's a really important story just in terms of young female designers not being so easily discounted. I'm so glad you're, you're saying that. I think so. You know, I never understood why there are not more industrial designers, female industrial designers, Um, I think we're very good at what we do. Design is teamwork. We're very good team builders and Mm -hmm. we collaborate very well. Uh, We're, you know, most women designers and professionals I know are also very humanistic Mm -hmm. um, and empathic. You know, some of design qualities are embedded in our nature that's not to say men don't have that. It's just that I think women also do have it in, in spades. And so it always surprises me why more companies don't choose, and especially, let's add, the greater percentage of consumers are also women. You know, why wouldn't you hire women designers? And this goes to the point you made in the beginning of, about how few people understand what design is all about Mm -hmm. and what it takes. My theory is that for more women designers to be employed, we need more executives to understand when and why they need design. As you know, these decisions are made at the C-level, at the um, chief Mm -hmm. CEO level or chief marketing officer, chief design officer levels, Mm -hmm. um, most of them are men. Mm -hmm. And so either they need to be men who trust women or they need to women who trust women. Mm -hmm. Um, And without that, it's really hard to convince because design is very much based on mutual trust um, because it's quite an investment. You know, um, you, you put a lot of money into new products it's quite risky because until it comes out, you don't know how it's going to turn out. Mm-hmm. It doesn't take a couple of weeks. It, you know, a design project usually takes, you know, unless it's UX design, but even then, you know, from six months to a year to two years, three years, you know, automobiles take up to five years. So a long answer to say there's much trust building that's needed mm-hmm. and, And I have this funny theory about, you know, men build trust by going to a sports bar and watching sports together. Um, And women build trust by going to the bathroom together. Ah. uh, So it's it's not that easy. Most men executives are not going to invite a woman to come to a sports bar with them. And if you don't have a lot of women executives that to have 
kind of personal conversations with, it makes that it slows that trust building down. I agree with you. I think there's a generational component to it as well. I think sons that grow up witnessing the power of strong mothers in the workforce are more inclined to, when they become men of power, are more inclined to understand the the capabilities of women. Do you think? I do. And I used to also say men who are in leadership positions who have daughters, strong daughters growing up, Mm -hmm. into independent and powerful women are much more sympathetic of what women need. Yes. Yeah. And what they need to lead. I love this conversation. And I think, you know, that the value of design and all those decisions that are made at the sea level, I think in both corporations and capitalist society, but also in in governance, in, in cities and state and federal government, we need chief design officers to help strategize and innovate in order to stay resilient and adaptive. And I think, you know, the real challenge is changing cultural perception of the value of design. And I think 3M's done a great job, and they have a chief design officer, and a few cities are now. Eric Quint. Yes. Yes, a good friend of mine. Back to you, there is also a very powerful love story that rides along with your love of industrial design. And I I definitely want to hear that story. I would be happy to tell you. So um, as you can see, I owe everything to industrial design, (laughs) (laughs) including love. Uh, So we'll go fast forward to, you know, I had a great partnership with Herman Miller that still continues um, and designed the first project actually I um, designed for Herman Miller was the Resolve office system. And so that in itself is a podcast. So we'll leave that story to another time. But <laughs> as I was emerging from uh, Resolve, Resolve was really changed the paradigm of office systems. And with that gave me more freedom in terms of choosing my clients. And I really wanted to work with Renault, the French automobile manufacturer, because I loved what they were doing in terms of their innovations Um, and had this idea kind of dream in my head. And I got to meet their um, chief design officer and eventually got a project with them. And they asked me to design a concept interior uh, for them from the perspective of an industrial designer. So industrial design, even though it's design of products, um, is different from automobile design. Automobile design is quite specialized. Mm -hmm. And so... It was interesting because they felt like, okay, how does an industrial designer, an industrial designer who designs office systems um, see automobile design and kind of see things differently from us? And I thought, great, I've been dying to to work with you. This is exactly what I've been hoping for. But I said, but I know nothing about cars and I need somebody from your side and a designer from your side to mentor me. Mm. And they said, okay, that's an interesting idea. And we're going to send you one of our best designers, BB Sec, and you're going to love him. <laughs> and apparently they told BB the same thing. BB, BB was between projects and they, they told BB, you're going to New York for three weeks to work with this woman. And, and by the way, you're going to love her. <laughs> so then you, that's the love story. That, that's what happened. We, li- we listened to our client. <laughs> And so I fell in love with Bibi and vice versa. And we became partners in life and at work. Wow. That's more foreshadowing. And was it electric, those three weeks of of learning about cars and learning about each other? Three months. Three months. Yeah. Three months. You seem to have had a lot of kismet in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Knock on wood. (laughs) <laughs> so for context, when was that, that you, you and BB fell in love? Uh, we fell in love, that was about right after 9-11, so 2002. How long did it take you to figure out that you were also going to 
form a design studio together and do life and all the other things that happen in life together? It happened pretty quickly because we kind of fell in love um, designing together. So, mm -hmm. And um, I loved how Bibi thought and designed and drew. And we had to make a choice because... Um, I lived in New York and I had a successful design studio in New York and BB, you know, his home was Paris and he was very successful. He had designed, when I met him, he had designed four automobiles for Renault and garnered a whole list of awards. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so he, he was very successful doing what he was doing, but he was in Paris. So we had to make a decision like, are we, am I moving to Paris or is he coming to New York? And as you know, you know, I'm calling you from New York, so <laughs> you can tell that Bibi came to New York. <laughs> that sounds magical. Your life really does have some some elements of real, real otherworldly charm. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, you you bring it out. It, it's just a, a pedestrian normal life, but the way you <laughs> ask the questions, it makes it magical. But thank you. <laughs> So I, I want to fast forward. So right after 2011, you fall in love, you form, you know, your studio, Bersel Plus Sec, which you're still working together and doing amazing industrial design and also raising children, three of them. Uh, life is sort of traveling along in a, in a pretty great clip. And then the 2008 recession happens. Crash. <laughs> yes. And, you know, you gave you gave a pretty powerful TED talk about how that made you reevaluate and, and look at all the parts and pieces of your life in a different way, which gave birth to your design the life you love chapter and book and movement. I would love to hear you deconstruct that chapter of your life for us. Just like you said, we were incredibly successful and then the um, economic crash happened and all our clients took the work in-house, which made complete economic sense from their perspective, but meant devastation for us. And, um, and I remember feeling very, very responsible because I was like, I convinced Bibi to leave his, you know, great job at Renault and come and partner with me in New York, promised them all these things. And now like we, we didn't have clients, we didn't have income, we had three kids and what do you do? The person that came to my help again was um, Leah Kaplan, who um, sat me down one day and said, look, you think differently. So you have all this time now you don't have any client projects, why don't you use this time to think about how you think? And that was the beginning of the self-discovery of um, me as a designer, kind of going inside my brain and figuring out, well, every project, what do I do that helps me come up with these ideas? And um, so I spent a year figuring that out and showing it to my friends, to Leah and others, um, and simplifying it and trying to understand what is it that they don't understand about this very simple process. And uh, because they would look at it and they'd, be, they'd go like, huh? Until I had like this four-step design process that I called deconstruction, reconstruction. And, um, and that, again, was kind of, I didn't know it at the time, but it was the beginning of this change of one, I had a design process and next interview I had was with GE and I showed them the deconstruction, reconstruction as port, part of our, um, you know, how we think for the first time. And with that, they gave us this, you know, quite a large project um, that I don't think they would have given us if it wasn't for our process. And they basically said, why don't you deconstruct and reconstruct value of design across all of GE uh, and tell us what you find out? So that was amazing. Whoa. And then the second thing happened to your point about design the life you love is I had years before, around the time um, that I had, a little bit before I met Bibi actually, I was part of a group 
uh, of women called um, Women Presidents Organization. And we had done an exercise where we had to create one sentence about our mission statement. And I happened to say, my mission is to design the life I love. And Amy, that stuck with me. I don't know why I said it. Um, and I was trying to be somewhat kind of funny and kind of say something about design. Mm -hmm. But that kind of followed me. And so fast forward to 2008, 2009, um, I had deconstruction, reconstruction, and suddenly this notion of designing your life and our life is our biggest project. I have a design process now can I apply that to my life and what would that look like? And then this friend of mine, Shirley Moulton, comes along and says, well, that sounds like a really interesting idea. Why don't you do a workshop around that for my company called Academy of Life? Uh, and, and before I knew it, I started doing workshops. I had never done workshops before, but I my first workshop was on teaching people how to apply design process and tools to their life. And I've been doing it ever since as my um, passion project. And, uh, and so I, that, I can that's imagine, what happened. Yeah. <laughs> and I can imagine the passion. It must feel so rewarding and fulfilling to have that one-to-one -one relationship with with humans and empower them to actually see what they're not seeing in their lives and and design it with intention it's unbelievable and it's actually uh, something that we really need right now now that we're in this very different and much bigger crisis uh, with the uh, COVID-19 virus but I'll come to that I just wanted to share with you that you know earlier we talked about design and how many people don't understand industrial design and i often joke about like um most companies they know when they need a lawyer mm -hmm. they know when they need a plumber but nobody knows when they need an industrial designer oh it's so true <laughs> it's so true and i go around pointing it out like you guys really need a designer and they're like what like to fluff pillows and like paint <laughs> choose a paint color and I'm just like, oh. <laughs> exactly. But then when I tell people, hey, I also um, teach people how to design the life they love and I wrote a book about it, people immediately go, oh, when is your next workshop? When is your next session? Can you do the, that for our co corporation company, for my team? It's just crazy. So there's something that is incredibly uh, organic and natural for us um, when we think about, oh, we can design our life, we can design our work. Our sense of design mm -hmm. in that context makes total sense and we're drawn to it. And what I've learned actually is that ordinary people, people who have no design background, mm -hmm. I affectionately call them ordinary people, and uh, <laughs> they're incredibly, extraordinarily creative. And all they need is a design process, just like any one of us. Yeah. They want to know, okay, how do I do this? That's been a, a huge part of my life. And like you said, it allows me to connect with individuals. It allows me to see how people transform their lives and turn constraints into opportunities and imagine their life with intention and with empathy and optimism. It's quite a public service, too. I'm a big <laughs> believer. No, I'm a big believer that everyone has is creative. But yes. so many people in their own non-believing of their own creativity, you know, that phrase, oh, I don't have a creative bone in my body, um, which is so not true. Yeah, they, all, all our bones are creative, actually. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and I believe if everyone gave themselves permission to explore and own their creativity – that in general, as society, we'd have a much greater capacity for complex problem solving. I, I whole, wholeheartedly believe that as well. And one thing about design that I didn't know, but I learned from one of my dear friends, um, Alex Osterwalder, is that he said, you know, most business people, they think 
there is only one solution to a problem. So they do a lot of research and then they go and look for that one solution. In fact, there are many solutions Mm -hmm. to one problem and you have to try a couple of them, prototype them to see which one is the right one or which ones can be combined to become the right one. So I thought everybody did that, that like as a designer, you, you think of multiple solutions until you figure out which one is the right one. <laughs> Apparently that's not the case. And most business um, education doesn't teach you to think in that m- multiple faceted way. So that is interesting because I kind of take it for granted too that everybody's sort of moving all the parts and pieces around to find a number of different workable solutions and then reverse engineering it to like what is actually doable from where we are now and then sort of connecting the dots. Exactly. And that that's, for example, for us as designers, trying something and seeing it not work, that's not failure. That's just part and parcel of what you do. That's yeah. information. That's how that's you information. find out. You know, That's you, more data to put into the hopper to make a better solution. Exactly. So I used to be confused about everybody talking about like fail fast, fail safe, fail this and that, like accept to fail. I'm like, of course. So <laughs> it slowly dawned on me in these conversations with Alex also helped me is that um, most business education and uh, framing is teaching you not to fail. Because if you fail, you know, you lose money, you lose face, you lose employees. But it's this notion that you can be prototyping multiple ideas without investing a lot of time and money. That's a skill. Um, (laughs) (laughs) To all the uh, leaders out there, that's why one of the reasons why you need um, designers. I actually wrote a whole article on when and why to call designers. Um, I love and it. Did a poster about it that I could share with you if you'd like to share it with your listeners. But Absolutely. I um, and then one day I was talking to Alan um, Malali, who was the um, the great CEO of Ford Motors, and he said, "Oh yeah, that poster, that poster is on my wall," and he sent me a photograph of it. I love it. <laughs> I was like, what? I <laughs> so love thank it. thank you, Alan. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to talk to you about this creative process that, that you've mentioned, deconstruction, reconstruction. You, you go into your four-point process in your TED Talk and in your book. And we also know that, you know, the, the 2008 economic crash was a really – turbulent time, which is kind of what led to you really analyzing yourself and doing the self-reflection needed to kind of really detail out this process. And I think now that we are in an unprecedented, crazy, global pandemic, obviously everybody's lives are turned on end and we have economic uncertainty in front of us, and certainly a whole lot of grief to process. And I think that your creative process could be so helpful to so many people. I I wonder if you can explain it and maybe explain it within the context of what we're going through now, how people can think about using it in their own lives. You're absolutely right. I don't think we could have imagined being in this situation if somebody had explained to us a year ago, like next year, this is how you're going to live. I don't think our minds could have grasped it. Um, But here we are. So deconstruction, reconstruction is about deconstructing the whole to see what something is made up of. And then the second step is point of view. It's how can we look at those same parts differently and see them from a new angle? And then the third step is reconstruction, putting the pieces back together, knowing you can't have everything. So what are your essentials? What are your nice-to-haves? What are your, the things you want to get rid of? And then the fourth step is expressing it, giving this design form. So how are you going to bring these things to life? And in this moment, I find that... Um, 
so many of us are reevaluating our lives and looking at what's essential to my life. What do I want to have learned from this moment in history so that when I come out of it, I am true to myself and I know what the things I want to keep are and what the things I want to get rid of are and, and some of the transformation. So to that end, we started um, when the pandemic started and we, in New York about a month ago, started sheltering in place. Together with my team, we thought, well, what could we do? And the first thing that came to our minds was like, how could we bring our Design the Life You Love community together? And could we be of service to them? And if so, how? So we reached out to them and said, what could we do? Like, would you be interested in um, designing your life in this moment? And we weren't sure. Like, they, they could have thought, well, that's the last thing I want to do right now. But they came back and they were like, that would be so amazing because we're all trying to figure out our lives right now. So we started doing these five o'clock teas every Wednesday for an hour on Zoom where people who've done the class or read the book and people who've never designed their lives but are interested in this moment to think about their lives like designers, we all get together and uh, virtually, of course. And uh, I give one, one prompt from the process a, a week. And we also have a guest and we talk about, with each guest, um, we talk about a different facet of our experience or emotion. And we do one creative exercise to think about our situation differently. And, and like designers, so with optimism, knowing that we'll come out of this and we'll be better for it. And how can we make that happen? And with empathy for ourselves and for each other and with collaboration. So how can we help each other think differently? So that, that's that been quite amazing. And I thought I was doing it for my community. It turns out I'm doing it very selfishly. It's the best thing <laughs> <laughs> that you know every week for me to do. And then we're also fueled by that now going back to our clients and saying this is a time for redesign how can we help you and mm -hmm. um and also putting together a webinar doing the uh, the creative session online uh, rather than in person which is what we always did but now taking it virtual i can give you some examples it's quite amazing how creative people are Yes, examples, illustrations would be great. Anything to make it kind of concrete so that we can visualize it too. Absolutely. So we'll start with deconstruction. When you deconstruct something, you see what it's made up of. But what you're also doing is you're breaking preconceptions about how you see the world. So just for one of my examples, because I, I always try my exercises myself mm -hmm. um, to just one, generate examples, but also to, to think about, like, almost like get out of my own head and th to think about my life differently. So I did a deconstruction of my life right now. And one of the things, and anybody could try this at home, but one of the things, building blocks of my life I wanted to deconstruct was well-being. So I thought, okay, you know, I'm mopping around house, thinking like I'm sheltering in place. So let me let me understand w what's my well-being made up of. And so I listed, kind of mind mapped my well-being. And I said, my family, uh, my home, my health, my work, thinking creatively, doing some physical exercise, this and this and that, traveling with my family and you know, hanging out with my friends. Long example short, w simple deconstruction of just well-being made me realize is that actually I'm complaining a lot, but almost all the pieces of my well-being, thank God, are still in place. Mm. My family is here. Bibi was almost stuck in Dakar, Senegal, where yeah. um, he had a great project going on and they closed the airports and he almost couldn't come back, but then he did. So... I'm grateful that he's here. The kids are here. I realized that, yes, this is a difficult moment, but 
I can still say the essential elements of my well-being are here. So that that's one thing. Then um, in terms of things to throw out, like one kind of funny example is like, I realized that I'm a busy person, like you're a busy person. Every week, an hour, at least an hour of my time went to the hairdresser. Mm. Because I have curly hair and I need mm-hmm. to like... And I don't like doing it myself. Um, so I go to a hairdresser that I love downstairs from me. And right now I can't go see him. And I'm, you know, I just pull back my hair in a ponytail. And that's an extra hour of my time. And in the process, I also realized that I actually forget about myself if I can help somebody in this time. So if I can call somebody, hear how they're doing or you know, coach somebody or mentor somebody, um, or simply like be be there for for a friend. And I thought to myself, you know, I should. One thing you could do going forward is that you're not going to be so vain about your hair going forward, mm-hmm. um, and use that time after you come out to go have coffee with a friend or anyone for an hour and just listen to them. I love that example. So if you if you see my hair all kind of <laughs> Aisha and a bad hair day, um, <laughs> I'm helping someone. Yes. So I want to see if I can make that happen. You know? <laughs> yes, but I also love that example because it it might you know depending on how you apply it to your life, it might be different for someone else. Someone who who doesn't normally take the time. To, maybe they they're spend the time on childcare and they don't spend the time taking care of themselves and they would feel so nice if they had more good hair days, you know, like they could, their decision might be the exact opposite of yours, which is I'm going to get, take that hour that I usually spend running errands and I'm going to spend it on myself doing something that makes me feel good about myself. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it's a very individual choice, right? Yeah. And, so when we started doing the teas, frankly, I was a little bit worried because like you said, we're all in different places and some of us are grieving uh, and grieving differently. They're not necessarily with their loved ones or the health is a big issue. There are people who've had uh, really hardships and losses. And I was like, I don't know if I have answers for for all those things. Um, but what happens is when we get together for an hour and people help each other. So what we do is one of the tools is how can we turn constraints into opportunities? Mm-hmm. And so people write their constraints and challenges in the chat box in Zoom. And then another person gives them ideas. So things like this came up, which we're really um, moving. So one person said, my boyfriend is quarantined in a different place and I'm really sad and another person offered her the idea of well why don't you express your love for him and write him old style love letters every day because we don't write love letters anymore another person said I don't know how to you know my mom's my 90 year old mom's birthday is coming up and you know I can't go see her and uh, you know make a cake for her what do I do and a bunch of people uh, in the group responded by saying, you know, why don't you order a cake for her? And then everybody in her community also makes a cake and you can all kind of hop on a Zoom call and blow out the candles together. Aww. How about you paint a, a painting, like invite your family and friends to do something for her, like paint a painting or do a little embroidery or something that is again, a DIY, th- that sense of collaboration also, that creativity of, um, I don't have the answer, but somebody else might have the answer. And together we might, one, share, two, find new solutions. Yes, those teas sound amazing. I want, I want to come to uh, Of course, <laughs> I'll send you the, the link. We're really opening it up to um, everyone who's interested. So um, if there are people who are listening and want to come to it, they can um, email me or they can email Beer Cell Plus Sec and we could um, 
put them on our mailing list. Oh, that is amazing. And we will include that information in our show notes so that people Great. can find it. So your your process of deconstruction, point of view, reconstruction, and expression is all geared toward what seems to me like an outcome of exponential generativity. And by that, I mean what is making you feel good is also a service to society in that you're listening to people, you're creating situations that are really fulfilling for you, for you, but they're fulfilling for other people. And when they're coming together in this way to fulfill themselves, they're coming up with ideas that end up helping people. And there must be a hot spot you can see from space <laughs> over these <laughs> sessions. But that exponential generativity is the equation that happens when you do something that feels really amazing for you that also ends up bettering other people because then they also learn from that and, and go out and make their lives better, which makes other people's lives better. Do you see what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. And as I was listening to Amy, it's beautiful what you're saying. I was thinking, and that's design. Yeah. So design is all about, and maybe that's where you, you were leading us to, is how can we solve problems collaboratively and with empathy and optimism and with an open mind so that we can better our lives? And it could be through designing your life or designing your work, and it's just you, your life, your work, and a design process, and just to be able to generate solutions for it and the, the sense of power of, and control that gives to someone to be able to do that mm -hmm. or to do it through the intermediary of products and services um, and experiences. But this also is a fundamental need for businesses right now to deconstruct and reconstruct themselves. And we see some of this happening naturally uh, around businesses that surround us, one of them being the restaurant business, for example. You know, they are deconstructing themselves and then looking at this catalyst of um, the coronavirus and saying, what's essential? What's something we need to get rid of in this moment? And how are we going to reconstruct ourselves and reinvent ourselves? And they're turning into corner stores or they're turning into drive throughs or but that that or online um, cooking classes and that kind of transformation mm -hmm. is truly what's needed. And that's what design is. You know, th that's what we do. So I have a I have a serious question for you. I, sure. I, I thought you all your questions were very serious and lovely. <laughs> but OK, a very serious question. Well, I mean, it's it's serious because it's about playfulness. And oh, OK. And you describe playfulness as, you know, that, that essence of yourself, that, that seven-year-old girl running yeah. through the wildflowers. And also as a... a Without key telling her mom. Right. You, yeah. <laughs> Don't tell my kids. It's all your own. <laughs> but you also describe playfulness as, a, as an important lens through which to view um, all the parts of your life that you've deconstructed. In the, in the point of view pro part of the process... When, when we're so consumed with fear and anxiety and a lot of resistance and a lot of grief, how do we get to that place of playful perspective? Being playful helps us kind of break our own preconceptions, things that uh, we assume to be true. And it's especially needed in these moments where problems are so serious Wrong thinking is one of my favorite examples. Wrong thinking is about how could you come up with the worst possible idea and then walk backwards from that or forwards from that to a good idea. One terrible idea is, for example, what if you gossiped about everybody at, at work? Mm -hmm. that, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> but what if you spread good gossip? What if you talked about people and actually told great stories about what wonderful people they, they are, uh, even when they're not in the room? That, that would be taking a terrible idea, gossip. 
um, and turning it on its head and making it a, a great idea. So I feel like here in this moment, we're pushed into a terrible idea. Yeah. You know, we, we didn't create it, but we find ourselves in this terrible idea of where we can't touch our um, friends, we can't hug people, we can't collaborate in person with people, and we can't go outside. And I think it, we need to be playful about, like, how can I turn this into a good idea? W- what are things that I could think differently to, to turn into, you know what, this is the best thing that happened to me. So I'm looking at this virus, and this virus is a silent, invisible contagion. What if there were other silent, invisible, contagious elements, but that were actually positive, that weren't destructive? Ooh, you are a natural-born designer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it would ripple out, and it would affect everyone, and it could be something like your, your positive gossip. And you just used a metaphor, by the way, which we could also talk about, which is one of my favorite tools, this invisible contagion. One of the uh, invisible contagions that I'm finding and I'm perceiving is gratitude. Mm-hmm. Yes. Have you seen this incredible, like, infectious gratitude that thing that's going around? Yes. It's incredible. (laughs) My voice cracked at the grocery store when I told the the cashier how much I appreciate him. (laughs) Exactly. But the howling and the music and the and the clapping for the healthcare workers. Yeah. It's so powerful. It's powerful. And it's exactly like you said, it's uh, it's this other virus. One of the masterminds of gratitude has become a dear friend of mine, Chester Elton. And he actually um, came to one of our virtual teas and um, talked about um, gratitude. And one of the things he said is, I just want to share this with you here because I find it so useful. It's so simple, but it's um, write a thank you card to somebody you love and then um, take a picture of it and send it to them. He also said, sit down for two minutes and write down the names of everybody you're grateful to. And he also says at the end of the day, write two, three, four, five things that you're grateful for. And it's a great way to kind of conclude your day. And we actually um, developed a little twist on that um, with one of my collaborators, Seda Eves, and then another dear friend of mine, Todd Churches, and said, um, let's take that and ask people to do a drawing of what they're grateful for. So we're generating not only gratitude in words, but gratitude in images. Mm -hmm. So everybody could give that a try. And when you're drawing and when you're thinking about gratitude, it really improves your mood. It does. It improves your mood and it improves your outlook. Because you start to hunt for the things that you're grateful for. And when you're really inventorying all of that, those good things every day, it's so much better than inventorying your fears, worries, and anxieties. Since I have your great great platform, and I just want them to think about their situation from a different perspective, basically think about it differently. And that is, imagine that your sheltering in place is actually your cocooning. So you're like a caterpillar, Mm -hmm. but you're now in your cocoon stage. And -hmm. when you come out of this cocoon, you're going to become a butterfly. If you know about cocooning, you know that um, inside the cocoon is complete mush, It's like soup. (laughs) Everything you know breaks down and then you you put it back together to emerge with your wings. So for those of you who are inside the cocoon, this is a great opportunity to think about what are things that you are intentionally turning into a mush uh, in a way? What are the things you want to get rid of and what are the things you want to keep? 
because the butterfly or the um, inside the cocoon, the caterpillar keeps still some of the things that eventually become uh, its wings and its antenna. And so even though we, everything we know has changed so fast, there are things that we still want to keep, but there are also things that we want to get rid of and transform. So this, this is a good metaphor to think about that. And then think about, and when you come out, what's going to be your wings? What's going to help you fly? I love that you use that metaphor, and I, I want to take it even a little bit further because I've been thinking about this a lot lately, too, just in terms of personal transformation. That time when it's time to break open the chrysalis, yeah, and we're going to emerge now as different beings, you yes. know, with, we'll have wings instead of, and, and we'll have a different perspective because we will now see things from an aerial view as opposed to down at the ground level. That's going to be weird and different too. How do we not get discouraged when, we, when our, we're flapping our wings? But do you, do you know what I'm saying? Like it I might not you. be easy to be a young butterfly. <laughs> yes. And how absolutely. do we not lose hope? when becoming a butterfly is hard and different and scary. You know, there's a piece to that, that, you know, how, how are you going to protect yourself from everything else, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I always fall back on my friends, friends in collaboration. I mean, look at us, the, just this collaboration that we've had over this podcast, right? Building on each other's ideas. Yes. To me, that, that really is the best no, that's exactly it. The, it's the, friends the, the and community. <laughs> it's true because especially if you keep your, while you're in the soup phase of this, if your friends are also soup, then everyone will be young butterflies together. Yeah. And with that shared experience, that's what we rely on. Oh, I love you, Aisha. <laughs> I love you, Amy. This was just, I had... No idea that we were going to land here, but <laughs> I've really enjoyed myself. Thank you so much for sharing your heart and your story and your philosophy and your creative process with us so that we can use it in our own lives. You're, you're so generous, and I'm so grateful for you. Thank you. you you've been an amazing host and con conversationalist, so thank you for creating the space for me to be playful <laughs> and to be myself, my seven-year-old self. Yay! <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that talk with Aisha. As promised, here is a special bonus. A short interview with Tomek Rigalik, a Warsaw-based industrial designer who, along with the Polish Cultural Institute New York and Wanted Design, has developed Circula, a social experiment in the form of public functional sculptures that aim to assist our recovery, reconnection, and strengthen our societal bonds in the aftermath of pandemic-related distancing and isolation. It's a profound project. Here's Tomek. My name is Tomek Regalik. I'm an industrial designer, lead designer at the studio Regalik, which works with architecture and products for premium companies and international brands. I'm an educator and also channel my work uh, towards the betterment of humanity and the planet. I turned my professional path towards what I felt is very meaningful to me. So this year you had a project planned with Wanted and the Polish Cultural Institute called the Eco Solidarity Platform. Can you tell me what it's about and how it is meant to serve and engage people? The plan was to create public space where various uh, designers and participants in the wanted design can sit together and discuss the future of our industry with sustainability at the center. To invite people to speak together openly and interpersonally in, in small groups about what can be done to truly contribute solving the crisis of our environment. The meetings were going to be programmed around down-to-earth strategies one can take as a designer 
to make a difference, to uh, amplify the issue and actually speed up the process of implementing necessary strategies that we are talking about for many, many years. But often we don't feel the sense of urgency. Unlike the current crisis, uh, we don't unite and tackle together in a more an intense uh, way, if you will. Climate crisis talk is frequently very abstract, but it sounds like what you were creating was a situation in which people could reclaim their agency and understand their ability to affect the built world in terms of the products that they're designing and creating and share strategy and also confirm the urgency. So it seems like it was about solidarity and camaraderie in terms of understanding how to assist the crisis in really concrete terms. And as I understand, you had also designed a work, a physical sculptural public furniture piece that was designed to assist these conversations. This piece of uh, kind of sculpture slash furniture um, for the public space is is a symbolic piece. It's a it's a circular shape when where people actually get into this common circle, this common ground of discussion, and sit together facing each other without any obstruction, without any mediation or any obstacles, and they discuss just uh, very openly what can be done. We we plan to um, have a program in place to bring very different people together to actually make sure that the conversations are, as opposed to being abstract and general, to uh, work out a real strategies and in a a collective camaraderie way to to actually bring people together on uh, how they can do it together as groups uh, often of interdisciplinary uh, character as everyone comes from a different place and background, uh, even in the design uh, community, it's it's quite all over the place where when it comes to what we tackle in, in everyday work and what we can actually impact. So this was about weaving this new possibilities, these opportunities that can be created between people that normally don't have an opportunity to tackle this critical crisis together. This this piece, this sculpture, it is called Circula. Can you describe it for me? Circula is a circular shape, essentially a bench in a circular form, which sits around 8 to 10 people. It's made out of wood. It's uh, made with a bent lamination. So it's actually uh, wood that is um, going around the circle to create a, an incredible effect of a kind of wholeness of the circle to get into it. One needs to cross the circular shape of the bench. So the act of going into the circle and being in the circle is very uh, pronounced, if you will. It's very visible and it's very much of a agreement of of being part of uh, this community uh, very symbolic in every aspect of it i mean it's you know circle has a shape it's very symbolic and it's been around for as long as uh, the humanity broke perhaps it's very egalitarian it's it's uh, there is no position uh, physically within the circle which uh, is more dominating uh, than others so originally this idea came to me as a as a is for the schools, for people who we need to really uh, slightly push, um, maybe not force, but push towards uh, being together uh, and face each other. Um, of course, it's not uh, binding them in any way. At every single point, you can step out if you feel like you don't want to be part of the circle anymore. But this shape and this this form gives a a certain situation which uh, pushes people to uh, in, on, onto each other in terms of their communication. This is uh, what uh, was envisioned. As you are designing and conceiving of this, um, the world is undergoing this incredible situation right now with the global pandemic. And 
you have shared with me how its meaning is now more important than ever. Will you talk about its purpose now and how that purpose has evolved? What has happened over the last weeks and, and months already is um, unprecedented. And we are asked to physically distance ourselves from each other. We do our bits on, on uh, various platforms to connect with, with each other. We very often, much more often than previously, wave at each other through our windows and actually are longing for human connection. The situation is showing how much we are this social species. This uh, symbolic piece has uh, become, in, in a strange way, um, a potential a solution for um, symbolic uh, coming together during and, and perhaps mm -hmm. an opportunity to rebuild our social connections and, and be together and, and actually um, re-establish what we uh, long for during this uh, time of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. It sounds like it could be a really beautiful and functional tool in assisting recovery and reconnecting, as you say. And so ideally, do you see this, you had mentioned schools, do you see this as a, a public piece in, in, let's say, parks or community spaces where people are encouraged to gather when, when the isolating is over? Absolutely. This is a piece for very for many types of public space, from uh, parks to indoor spaces, or even our out outdoors areas around our neighborhoods. Uh, actually, can live pretty much uh, anywhere. This is a truly versatile and, and universal design piece that that can really occupy very different spaces. I love the sound of it, and I love conceptually the idea of building functional sculpture and furniture that is specifically designed to foster connectivity, community, strategizing, and reconnection. I know you had plans to launch this piece at Wanted to Design, but those plans, they had to undergo radical transformation. <laughs> and there's probably a lot of things still in the air. But what's the ideal future for this piece? And, and how will people be able to access it? I see this project in plural terms. I see this as a not just one piece, uh, which we were going to launch during Wanted Design, but a growing network of circles of such. Therefore, we are launching a website. It's a nonprofit called um, circula.org. Everyone can learn a little bit more on what it does and how it functions and how it looks like. And also, if anyone is interested, it can be ordered from the site. We are determined to actually provide for every circle ordered yet another to a community in need somewhere in the world because we feel that the, the more the merrier. I hope that I get to experience it in person soon. And for all of our listeners that want to track the progress, the circula.org website is the place to go. Hey, thanks for listening. To see images of Aisha Bersal's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app or go to cleverpodcast.com, where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would, please do us a favor and rate and review. It really, really helps. We also love chatting with you on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Clever Podcast, and you can find me at Amy Devers. Clever is produced by 2VDE Media with editing by Rich Straffolino and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.